Today on Cross Defense, we work our way through your emails, finding encouragement to be bold in the faith, even when it means walking away from sources of earthly security, getting away from those online caves we love so much, and stirring others up to be unashamed of the gospel. So grab your Bibles. We're getting into all of that and more right now on Cross Defense. Welcome back to another episode of Cross Defense. This is the show that aims to equip the mind, excite the imagination, and comfort the soul, and aims to do all of those things with God's Word. I'm your host, Reverend Tyrell Bramwell. I'm the pastor of St. Mark Lutheran Church out here in Ferndale, California. If during the show, my friend, you'd like to send us your comments, your questions, your bits of biblical brilliance, well, we would appreciate it. So go to stmarksferndale.com slash contact. That's S-T-M-A-R-K-S, ferndale.com, slash contact, Marks ferndale.com, slash contact, and drop us a line. You can also find St. Mark on Instagram and Facebook. Look for the Winged Lion logo, and I'm on YouTube. That's where we host our Winged Lion videos. You'll find at least one of those mentioned today in the comments from the inbox, one of you guys. So other cross-defense listeners like those other series as well, you might too. Have a look. All the links are in the show notes below, so you can just click them and jump to wherever you want to go. If you have a general comment and you want to rate or review the show on the platform that you use to listen to this podcast, well, we'd appreciate that too, friend. Anything you can do to help us share cross-defense with our neighbors is greatly appreciated. Let us help them equip their mind, excite their imagination, and find the comfort of Christ crucified for the forgiveness of sins for their soul. Okay, so let's get into the inbox and let's get to work. Lori wrote in to thank us for taking the time to address her question of pastoral and political language on the July 29th show. And in reference to the Luther Classical College interview in that episode with Reverend Gregory Schultz, she says, Pastor Schultz's book... The problem of suffering is outstanding. I've recommended and given his book to others. Awesome, Lori. Absolutely. That's what this is all about. Thank you for sharing that, dropping that little plug for for Pastor Schultz's book. And now you, dear Cross Defense listener, you can find that link in the show notes as well. Reverend Schultz's book will be a blessing to you and to yours should you give it a read. Chandra wrote in regarding the July 15th episode. She said, I enjoyed your video with Jordan Peterson, Mulling Faith. Thank you. Well, Chandra, you're welcome. It is always a pleasure to be of service. And she also says, I was encouraged to learn of the Thrivent rep who was quitting his job, as I have walked away from my job at a church, Good News Rescue Mission in Redding, California. Because of their unchristian behaviors... I know the financial uncertainty this decision creates and the faith we must then stand on as rent, car insurance, etc. becomes due. Unlike many churches, we must stand for right, no matter how scary. Chandra, it is my sincere pleasure to be of service to you, to be a vehicle to share with you others serving you as well. That thriving rep who wrote in, He encouraged you, and now you have written in, wrote in, written in, yes, and you encourage us. So thank you, sister, for also being encouragement for others. It takes a lot of courage, as you mentioned, to be able to step away and, and hang on the faith that you have in Christ Jesus to take care of you. So you're most welcome, and I also want to return the thanks to you. Thank you for building us up. It serves to stir all of us up to love and good works, encouraging us as we see the last day drawing near, just as Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 says, right? Yes. Christians need not fear a thing. We are staked to Jesus. Our God is good, as you know. As we all know, as Christians know, and we need to hear that over and over and over again because the devil would like to to make us forget that. He would like to push that out of our hearts and minds. But no, sir, it's not happening. And we know, we know that for, for those who love God, all things work together for good, right? For those who are called according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. Financial stability, it may be frightening, 
when it starts to be unstable. But let us always remember that St. Paul was inspired to write in Romans 8 also these words. We are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Mm, That's such good stuff, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. So again, Thank you. I'm glad you were encouraged in the faith by that episode, and I hope others will be encouraged in their faith by this episode. This is how this works. We got a little economy going on, don't we? And it's a blessing to be of service, just as it is a blessing to be served. Absolutely. Christ be with you, sister. Thank you so much. Ronald says, is it possible to get a set of the unashamed cards I live in Texas and would love to get a set. Thank you. I wish my Lutheran church was as outspoken and involved as yours. Now, you might not know this, dear saints, but Ronald is talking about the collectible cards that we produce here at St. Mark to encourage each of us here at this congregation to be unashamed of the gospel. As you know, if you've been following the show for a while, we have many outside pressures that try to make us ashamed of the gospel, try to silence us in the face of their intimidation. But we are not ashamed of the gospel, for we know the gospel is our everything. And so it's one fun way, these collectible cards, these unashamed cards, are one fun way to stir each other up here at St. Mark. And I'd love to hook you up, Ronald. I would love to, my friend. I, I, I really would. But there's a unique feature of these printed cards that actually prohibits me from doing so. I know you don't, you're don't, you not aware of this, and I, I'm really uh, sorry to say, sad to say, that we only distribute them in person. That's kind of part of the whole thing. And we do it at random times in the life of the congregation. The members don't know when these cards are going to appear. It's kind of fun, but it's also what's prohibiting me from being able to say yes and to give you a set of these cards. You have to be present to get them. And this makes collecting them kind of a special goal for the members. If I sent you a set of them, well, then I'd be committing something kind of like a cardinal sin in the eyes of the members here. And, well, I might be on a restricted status before I knew it, and I don't want that to happen. <laughs> so as... Uh, As a brother in Christ, please understand and be gracious. As for wishing your Lutheran church was as outspoken and involved as ours, well, can I ask you a simple question? I I just want to probe a little bit, inquire a little bit. What's prohibiting such a thing from happening? Why aren't you guys? What's the difference? I know as a pastor that many pastors feel restrained by the flock they serve, and I've served multiple flocks, and I know that feeling firsthand. There are, sometimes there are sinful power structures in play at the local congregational level that mute the church's voice, the church's public voice, which is usually the pastor. Now, in other situations, it's the people that are muted. The people are prepared to be very outspoken. They're prepared to be very engaged, but it's the pastor who's not well trained to take those steps, especially given our culture right now, as we are shifting or have shifted from a culture where uh, being a Christian pastor really just kind of meant maintaining the flock. It meant uh, just sort of the status quo, keeping the status quo together. There wasn't a lot of threats from the outside because we were part of the, the hegemony. We were part of, of the, uh, the, the consensus of the culture. It was expected, but not anymore. So there's many pastors, depending on how old your pastor is or what his background is, who, who aren't equipped or well-trained or well-practiced in 
what it is to be outspoken in a way, at least in the way that you pick up that we are. Uh, and, and please keep in mind, we didn't do this on purpose, or we didn't end up in this way um, actually by any means of our own. There's no boasting that we can do here at St. Mark. This is all the Lord. And we were, uh, we, well, I stumbled into our outspokenness. I always wanted to be an outspoken pastor. I always wanted to be a bold pastor. It wasn't that I didn't. I wasn't trying to, to silence the gospel and to silence the law when that's needed either. But in this particular case here at St. Mark, I didn't know the reaction our sign was going to get when I put up the sign that set all this off. We were using our sign to speak boldly. Yes, we were being outspoken in that way. And we were involved in other ways, um, you know, things like writing my Wazzlewood books and, and different things like that. I've, we've done stuff like that. Um, but, but what you're experiencing now, a lot of that and a lot of what I share here on Cross Defense and over on my YouTube channel and, and on our website and things, a lot of it has been by necessity of owning the consequences of that very first sign. And we've been engaged and we have now chosen prayerfully so, to continue to be engaged, understanding that this is now the culture we're in and that we want to faithfully serve our neighbors and and lead them to Christ and come into the darkness where they're at and defend them from the, the heresies that are coming after them in the name of Jesus. Yes, the LGBTQ do come in the name of Jesus um, and, and to defend them from that. So I ask you to have grace for your pastor if he's not well-trained. Help him if you can, but if it's the people who are not quite ready to support your pastor, well, then maybe you can be an influence in the congregation to help encourage them to be be more receptive of your pastor being outspoken, because I know many pastors want to be, but they have to try to figure out a way of doing so without uh, driving the the sheep that are there away, uh, being scandalous to them, and to walk with them in a, in a responsible way. So there's a lot to it. Uh, if you want to write back in, I'd love to hear actually what you have to say. I, I mean it when I ask, why not? Why, what's not happening at your church that you wish would happen? And, and um, so anyway, we'll, let's go from there. Um, but no matter what the scenario is, a solution is to be had. And, and you, you, Ronald, can be a catalyst for changing your congregation's disposition winsomely, and I'll use that word very sparingly, um, it's, it's a buzzword that can be misused a lot, but you can do it respectfully in your vocation uh, by encouraging the proper parties to fulfill their vocations. So go ahead. If you want to share with us some more of your of what's going on in your culture, in your congregational culture, I should say, what's holding you guys back, I'd love to hear it. Um, I can keep some of it to myself if it's not appropriate for everything, but whatever, you know, that kind of thing. I'm, I'm just here to help if I can be. So we'll see if we can work through uh, options to assist you if you want to write in. So that's it. Um, and you're there in Texas. So California helping out Texas, that's one for the record books, isn't it? <laughs> All right. So Samantha says, thanks for writing in, Ronald. And sorry, I can't be uh, assistance on the cards. But if you do come to Ferndale... I'd be happy to hook you up with uh, what I can if you make a trip out here and things like that. So if you're ever present locally when we're handing out a card, you'll certainly get one. (laughs) I'm glad you like them. Okay, so Samantha says, good morning, Pastor Bramwell. I love listening to Cross Defense. Thank you. That's humbling. You really help equip me to be more willing to take on tough conversations with peers. (laughs) Awesome, sister. Go get them. Go get them. So thank you. No, thank you. You're most welcome, sister. You're most welcome. God be praised. You know, it's all him, absolutely. As I say on this show on a pretty regular basis, I am a broken shovel. You are a broken shovel. We are not only tools in the garden, but we are broken tools. We're destroyed tools. We're rusted out, junky tools. And yet somehow God can work through us, and he makes things come about, doesn't he? It's great. It's glorious. It's a privilege. And we give him thanks and praise for all that he does. You uh, you said here, Samantha continues to write, I am a public school music teacher. I worked in a larger city for a bit and am now in a rural community, but public school nonetheless. 
I'm a firm believer that we need Christian teachers in public schools because we understand our place in the lives of students. And many are from low-income households that cannot afford private school. But as a confessional Lutheran, it's difficult to see public schools crumble. So how do I continue in my vocation when I see public schools broadcasting their woke ideologies? Samantha's email came in after the August 5th show where we talked about pulling our kids from public schools. We took a look at the uh, LCMS founders and how they came over here from Saxony to get their kids out of what they called Sodom and Gomorrah and how we've uh, returned to that. We have that going on again. And, you know, I'm super glad to hear of Lutherans who want to serve their neighbor when they talk about their vocational uh office and understanding their vocation as confessional Lutherans. It is a blessing to know we have people out there who want to serve their neighbor. So Samantha, thank you for writing in. We're going to take a break right now. And when we come back, we're going to get to the answer to your question as best as I can give it to you, not knowing your particulars. And um, in the meantime, if you want to write in for you know, us to answer your question here on this show, you can do that by going to stmarksferndale.com slash contact that's s-t-m-a-r-k-s ferndale.com slash contact we'd love to hear your question and if at all possible to be able to answer it for you or at least give you some guidance that your pastor can work with there locally all right let's take our break we'll come right back for the second segment of cross defense Welcome back to the second segment of Cross Defense. Today on the show, we're looking at the inbox to take a look at some of your questions and get some answers to you because we appreciate you write in. You're part of this conversation, and that's the way you can do it, and this is the way I can do it, and now we're talking. So it's great. Thank you very much. We're considering what Samantha writes in. As she says, she's a public school teacher, and she wants to be able to maintain her vocation as a public school teacher in service to the students but the public schools are broadcasting woke ideology. So what does she do? And I'm super glad when I hear that we have confessional Lutherans peppered in throughout the public school system for the same reason, dear friend, that I'm glad when I look over at the car passing me in traffic when I'm driving down the road, driving up to 101, heading into Eureka, I look over and the car's zooming past me, I'm super glad to see that there's a driver in that car, right? Yeah, it's really good. I recognize someone's piloting that car. That particular car has someone at the wheel, and that's a blessing. But what do we do when we realize that the driver operating that vehicle is actually operating a rolling death trap? When we, when we look beyond just the car and the, and the driver passing by real quickly, and we see that the, the wheels seem to be coming off, that there's sparks flying out from underneath the car. You know, the, the, the wheels are wobbling so bad that you expect to see one fly off at any moment. You see, it's rusted out around the bottom and all these things, and it's just in really bad repair. What do we do when we notice that's the situation of that car? How does that make you feel about seeing the driver of that car. If they were uh, driving down, at, let's say you're going 80, they go flying past you at 95 in that kind of condition. You see the spark streaming out from under it, wondering if it's going to blow up at any moment. And then you notice, then you notice that the person you thought driving the car is actually not in the driver's seat, but in the passenger seat, that you were fooled by, by the perspective shift, right? Like one of those moments when you look over at the stoplight and you see the dog in the passenger seat and it looks like the, do the dog is driving the car. You ever had that kind of a moment? And, and you realize, no, no, the person's not driving. Your vantage point was skewed. The person is actually in the passenger seat. And then you notice there are kids in the back seat. And it's an SUV and there are more kids even behind the back seat. And... You look up ahead and you notice you're coming to a cliff, a cliff on a corner. What's going to happen to this car that's barreling down the road as if it's out of control? Maybe its brakes are gone and there's no one at the wheel. 
There's plenty of passengers, but it's in bad shape, and there's no one at the wheel. Now, you wouldn't have thought twice about it in a normal situation. But given that this vehicle is a death trap, without a driver, full of passengers, barreling toward a cliff, the question is, are we still glad to see the so-called driver in that car? Are we still glad to see confessional Lutherans in the public school system? No, <laughs> actually, this might be shocking to you. I know not many pastors want to say these sorts of things. But that is the situation that we have in our state school system right now. In many of them, we see a secular death trap for students and teachers alike as a pastor, I'm concerned about the teachers of the congregation who are also in these situations. I'm concerned about the teacher who's part of, of the teacher's union that is indoctrinating them into all these woke ways over a slow period of time, over the course of their career. I know of teachers who entered in as faithful Christians and retired in denial of their wokeness. You would ask them if they're Christian, they say yes, privately. But publicly, they want nothing to do with the church that stands up for truth. See, I love your heart, Samantha. I absolutely adore your heart. And so let me ask you a very real question, sister. What is your place in the lives of your students? whether they're from low-income households or not. Those are the details you included, right? What's, what's your vocational role in the lives of your students? The reason I ask this question is because there's a lot of confusion about that in our culture today, which is really why we're having so many of these problems at the school board level. Many teachers, now I'm not saying you, but many teachers, I would say the culture of public school teaching is that the teachers have a different perception of what their role in the students' lives is, are. Uh, hopefully you're not an English teacher. Um, <laughs> than the parents do. The parents see you, or ought to see you, in a different vocational light then your peers see you, your, your teaching peers. Assuming you're a confessional Lutheran surrounded by a bunch of non-Lutherans. The answer to, your, to the question I pose to you is, what is your place in the lives of your students? The answer is, as a hired teacher. That's the, that's the short answer. Their parents even if it's through the tax system, their parents have given you the job of teaching their kids certain subjects, nothing else. That's it. That's the job. Staying in a public school because you're an outstanding math teacher or something and you're willing to sacrifice personally for the sake of the families who can't afford a private school math education. That's a noble heart. That's in line with what you said. That's a noble heart, and that's awesome. That's the Lutheran way of serving neighbor, the Christian service to neighbor, rightly, according to our vocational duties. But let me probe a little deeper. Why are you a firm believer that we need Christian teachers in public schools? Where's that come from? Are you able to share Christ crucified for the forgiveness of their sins with your students? Is that part of your job? Are you allowed to do that? Are you, are you able to protect your students from evil, from the evil of the woke ideology? Are you able, according to our metaphor, are you able to grab the wheel of the car and somehow stop it from flying off the cliff? Or are you just sticking around to comfort the kids 
as the car goes headlong into the abyss, crashing at the bottom of the ravine, killing everyone. And sister, please hear all these questions pastorally. These are sincere questions from a sincere heart that cares about you and and your place, not even knowing you, but knowing you're a Christian. I have a love for you in that regard. So this is real stuff I want you to think about. And the, and the reason I push here is because we've had Christian teachers in the public school system all along in America, and none of them kept the car from becoming a, a rolling death trap. There was a time when things could have been addressed that would have prevented the woke ideology from ever entering the system, but weren't, or weren't successfully. And now the wheels are about to come off. Now the sparks are about to ignite the gas tank. Now the cliff is about to roll up on us. So that's why I ask what your place in the lives of your students is. Because you might be burdening your own conscience unduly without even realizing it, trying to be a loving neighbor to your neighbors, a Christian neighbor to your neighbors, trying to love them the best you can, but not realizing that maybe you're doing more than you even are supposed to or need to. Because your role in their life is not mom, it's not friend, It's not life coach or advocate or any of these things. It's teacher. And not teacher in the biblical sense, not not pastor. You don't take on a responsibility for the the class like like I, I do for the congregation. It's a different role. Yours is one, a vocation that is hired by parents to teach their kids math and biology, grammar, etc. If all the Christian teachers, get this, this is awesome. If all the, the amazing people like yourself, the Christians serving in our secular schools, who obviously, obviously have a Christian love of neighbor, motivating what they do and why they stay, if all of them understood as we do as confessional Lutherans that their vocational duty has a freedom in it that allows them to see themselves as they truly are, calling a spade a spade, seeing the teacher in the public school as a hired hand in service to parents, and if all of you were able to say, I'm I'm not going to stand for this anymore. I will not, I cannot, work in a school that is actively and intentionally working against parents with these evil, woke ideologies. Well, that would do something, wouldn't it? The parents and the school would be forced to come to terms with what they want, and they would be forced to do it in a hurry if every Christian teacher joined hands and did this together. If parents go to school boards complaining that they can't get good teachers like yourself because you won't work for the school as long as it's woke, then the school board members, the trustees, would either solve the problem by dropping the woke garbage, as they should, or then the parents, if they didn't, then the parents would re-elect different school board members, right? They would, they would put other people in those positions better ones, who would actually listen to the parents because they want teachers like you in their school district. But either way, the Christian teacher sticking around for the sake of the students is actually doing a disservice to the families because you're effectively a bumper, a buffer for the woke agents in the positions of authority in the state school system where you teach. That's not what you mean to be. It's not what you're intending at all. Your heart is pure, and you're serving your neighbor according to your vocation. But if you understand your vocation rightly, all of a sudden you become empowered to do something 
in service to those people that you want to serve, right? You don't want to be inadvertently a relief valve for the evil operators, and that's how they're treating the Christians and all the teachers in the schools. And sometimes, oftentimes, we can think that what we're doing is good, it's right, it's noble, but when in actuality we stop and we think about it, what we're doing is actually aiding and abetting the very evil that we want to counter. See, would that all Christians would walk away from every public school that has adopted woke ideology. I'm not saying every public school has, but those who have, would that they would say, you can have your evil, but you will have to have it without me. Because then, Samantha, all of this, all of this would come undone in a, in a hurry. And I say this to you, sister, as the husband of a school teacher, I'm not far from your considerations. I, I know what's going on in your mind at a real personal level. I bet a lady like yourself, actually, with a heart like yours, I bet you could step away from the public school, open a private tutoring business with, with a business model that will allow you to serve families of all income levels which will allow you to be a real solution for families in that same school district and yet not be complicit in the wickedness of the woke world. I bet you could assist parents at your, at your church with a, maybe a homeschool co-op or something like this. I know that you could figure out a way to do this in our modern age and not have to participate in the broadcasting of these evil, sinful, woke ideologies. And if you're not in it for the state pay and the state benefits, then you have nothing to lose, right? I mean, you could, if you're in it to serve your neighbor, you could do it for free. You could step away and you can open a service tutoring these people with your education, with low income, no charge. Well, we'd love to hear how things turn out, sister. Thank you for writing in. I truly appreciate that you would think enough of me to let me take a crack at this question for you. Um, you asked another question. What did you say? You said, one more question, completely unrelated to the above. Why do we only have one baptism, but the Lord's Supper is as often as possible? <laughs> oh, good question. Are our sins not forgiven when we confess our sins and ask for forgiveness? Are we only forgiven when we partake in the Lord's Supper? And lastly, why is communion closed? I recall learning back in confirmation class that it's harmful to partake in the Lord's Supper if you don't fully understand it. But why is that so? Hold on, wait a minute here, Samantha. <laughs> My wonderful sister in Christ. You said one more question. You're the teacher, but as I count it, that's five questions, isn't it? I counted five question marks in there. <laughs> Good stuff, though. Uh, no, honestly, I truly appreciate that you think enough of me to ask this question here at Cross Defense. I'm sure your pastor could answer it better than I can, knowing the questions behind your questions. But um, let me just take another crack at this as well. The word and sacraments, um, and sacraments meaning baptism and communion, all three of them are means by which God gives us his grace. The word, baptism, and communion, all three of them. That's how gracious our God is, sister. He births you into his forgiveness, and then he sustains you in that forgiveness through his word and his supper, which, as I think about it, answers the first three of your five questions. So why, are, why are children only born once? Seems like a silly question, but it's the same question. They're born once, but they eat every day, right? That's the exact same reason why we as Christians are only born from the Father once, in baptism. And yet, we eat from his table in the Lord's Supper as regularly as possible. Jesus instituted a word and sacrament economy, an economy of forgiveness. Communion is is closed as part of that economy for the same reason that your pharmacist doesn't give you 
any and every pill that happens to be behind his counter, but only the pills that you've been prescribed and only after you've been consulted, after you've gone to the consultation window to learn what it is that you're eating so that you can eat it to your benefit and not to your harm. Make sense? Good. Because I think that answers both of the last two questions. <laughs> this has been fun. Thank you so much, Samantha, for writing in. I really appreciate that you took the time to do so. Christ be with you as you navigate your school situation. You're in my prayers. You have a wonderful, wonderful heart that wants to serve your neighbor, and I'm sure your local pastor will be able to guide you much more adequately than I can, seeing how I don't know your situation as fully as he will, and uh, so please seek his counsel. Let's take a break right there. We'll come back for our third and final segment of today's show, and we'll deal with a few more questions from the inbox. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. This is great, even though here in the Wingline studio, it's getting really hot. These summertime broadcasts are getting pretty warm. We'll talk to you soon. We'll be right back after this break. All right, welcome back to Cross Defense. Let's get right back into work here, going into the inbox. Brian writes, Pastor Bramwell, thank you for your continued messages that you share. These are helpful things for those of us in internet land. While perusing your archive of videos, I was intrigued by your episode 10 on KNCL, Facebook idleness. While I understand and agree with your premise of not actually interacting with real people, i.e. those around you, I wonder what should someone do that doesn't really have much around him to interact with on the level that some of those good theological conversations online can provide. In other words... Would it have been a bad thing if Elijah was able to chat with the other 7,000? Thank you for your time and again for the teaching that you share online. And if you happen to answer this on some episode, could I ask for a pingback? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Just so I can know to listen. The Lord be with you as you fight the good fight in Ferndale and Humboldt County. Absolutely. I'll send you a, a little uh, email message here, Brian. So hopefully you got that and you're able to listen. Great question, brother. So let's read 1 Kings 19, 1 to 18, and then take a crack at answering your question. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. And then he was afraid, and he arose, and he ran for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and he left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he asked that he might die, saying, it's not enough now, O oh Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down, and he slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And, and he ate, and he drank, and he lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time, and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. There he came to a cave, and he lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. The people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. 
and after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Haziel to be king over Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel, Meholah, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death, and the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. For the sake of all the other listeners out there in internet land, those of you besides Brian who already knows what we're talking about, I hold the premise that being together in real life is far better than simulating togetherness via social media. Considering this view in terms of Elijah in the cave, per Brian's question, we could say fairly that social media is not the interconnected world that we think it is but the cave in which far too many Christians are hiding. Where we we think we're carrying out our Christian duty, our Christian vocation, our call to encourage one another and stir one another up in the faith in these high-level theological conversations, but are in fact being hindered by the illusion of interconnectedness that is severely disconnected. Hence the title of the episode, Facebook Idleness that we can be doing so much work on Facebook that we're not doing any work in real life. So let's start with the Lord's question to Elijah in the cave. What's he say? What are you doing here, Elijah? To which we might say in the manner of Elijah, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. God, your Christians have forsaken your covenant and they've rejected your word for sparkle creeds and false peace and and temporal comfort and and they persecute your faithful pastors and I, even I only, am left and and they seek my life to take it away. So, So I'm here on the internet, out of harm's way to preserve my life. But, but where I can chat with the remnant of other Christians who, who are also holed up in their own caves where they're at. To which our Lord might say something like, stop hiding in this online cave. Why? Because of the ordering of the account. Notice, God tells Elijah about the 7,000 after He tells the prophet to return on his way to the wilderness of Damascus. He tells him to go and get on with the anointings. And then he says, oh, and Elijah, you're far from the last faithful guy out there. So, would it have been a bad thing for Elijah to be able to chat with the 7,000? Well, yeah, given that he didn't know about the 7,000 until at the very end of the story, right? Given the sinfulness of man, I think it would have been a bad thing. Let's say at the very least, to be gracious, it could have been a bad thing. Brian, excite your imagination with me, brother, and think about how social media makes us feel like we're doing the thing when really we're avoiding the thing. And that's the whole premise of that video, right? KNCL 10, cancel Christian comment number 10. That's my argument about the Facebook idleness. But the Elijah comparison aside, I want you to know, friend, that I hear your wonderfully honest question. And I don't think your question actually relates that much to Elijah because Elijah has a fear aspect to it, and you're talking more of a disconnect from resources. 
You ask, what should someone do that does not really have much around him to interact with on the level that some of those good theological conversations online can provide? So I think it's actually a, a completely different type of question than the one the Elijah scenario can answer. I'm still going to say that you would be far more enriched with a lower level theological conversation in person than the higher level theological conversation on what is essentially a high speed telegram service, messenger, chatting. You are going to be far better served with real human interaction than you are at the best online conversation, theological or otherwise. That's, my, that's my, my place, my position. My suggestion to you, brother, is to be like the old school pastor, the guy who was called from the seminary to serve a rural parish out on the farm somewhere. What did that guy do to remain a part of the high-level theological conversation when there was nobody around him to aid in that endeavor and the internet didn't exist? What, what did they do to stay stimulated and to stay engaged and to stay sharp? Church. Church throughout time and space, right? He gathered in real life with real humans and he read the Bible. And he read books about the Bible and about creation, and about all the different things going on in the world, he read. See, that's where high-level theological conversations are truly had. Coming together in real life, where real human beings are wrestling with real sinful problems, and real hurts, and heartaches, and joys, and celebrations, and having all of that context of not living in a cave, and then being able to read the Bible and other great works where the conversation is being had. So I would say to you, brother, read the great books of the Western world and join in that, what they call the great conversation. Read the good, timeless words. Read the Christian works. Join the theological conversation throughout all history. Read Luther. Read Augustine. Read Ambrose and Polycarp. Read Read your pastor's sermons. Ask him for that kind of stuff. Talk to your pastor. Use the internet to access those kind of voices since we do have that tool. And then log off. Turn off this podcast and spend time with the real people God put in your life wherever he planted you. Now, am I completely naive to the reality that social media is part of our lives? And that it isn't going away? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. It's here, and it's a tool at our disposal. But I think the temptation for the blessing to turn into a curse is very, very great. And, is, and that's normally what happens, which is what's going on with that entire episode of Facebook idleness. But there is an, an entirely different option as well. One that you might consider radical, I don't know. And I don't know your given situation, so it may not be feasible, but there is another option on the table. And it's not unheard of either. Absolutely not. Brother, you can always move to where you can have those real high-level, real-life conversations with the people that you're talking with online. You can actually move there and engage in, in back porch conversations with them and make them the people who are in your real life life. <laughs> when I was a recruiter at the seminary a couple years ago in Fort Wayne, I went to church with families that moved to Fort Wayne not to go to the seminary, but to go to Redeemer Lutheran Church. One family that I went to church with while I was there moved from Southern California for the real human community at Redeemer. It's not a radical concept. People do it all the time. 
Their priority was to be around other confessional Lutherans, having those kind of conversations to raise their children up in that kind of culture. So if you're up for that kind of adventure, well, brother, might I suggest that uh, Ferndale, Ferndale, California, has a burgeoning group of theologians who love to talk shop, my friend. We do. We love to talk shop. And you'll even be hated for the Lord's sake. It's a joyful thing. So come on over. We'd love to have you. All right. So I, I hope you're served by this. And I, uh, for all of you guys, I really appreciate it. I can't stress this enough. To be a pastor on the radio, on a podcast like this, to be able to engage with you in this disconnected way, I recognize even in the conversation of Brian's question that we're using the very tools that I'm, I'm denouncing in a sense and I'm trying to downplay. Well, why am I doing that? Because these tools are the easy tools. It's so much easier for us to actively engage each other online. It's become the norm for us. And so I appreciate that you treat me in a way that has respect and honor, where you would send me real questions, real things that you're struggling with in your life. And, and I want you to know that I take that very seriously. And I don't uh, offer suggestions or comments without prayerful consideration before I compose something in my mind to say to you. So thank you very much for that. What I want to say, though, with that is please take all of these questions that you've, you've sent in and bring them to your local pastor as well. He's going to know more about your life situation, and if he doesn't, he can ask you right there in person and get a much better read on how to serve you and help you. Treat Cross Defense. Treat all of KFUO Radio. Treat all of the theological substance that you take in from the Internet as supplementary to what your pastor is giving you on a regular basis. To, to use the, uh, the eating analogy as we were talking about like the pharmacy and taking the pills and things like that, these are vitamins. Cross defense is a vitamin, which your pastor can give you in the sermon and in Bible study and in his one-on-one -on -one conversation with you. That's, that's the dinner. That's the full meal. That's the hearty, meaty stuff. So bite into that and spend your time in the word and, and, in the word with your brothers and sisters there in your local congregation, and then treat this as a supplement. Thank you so very much for all of your, your wonderful emails. we got many more to get to, so we'll be adding those into the lineup here in the future. Thank you again for your comments, your questions, your bits of biblical brilliance. You have them. I know you have them. So excite that imagination. Equip your mind. And I hope that Christ is the comfort for your souls that you Receive him every Sunday, week in and week out, and know that you are forgiven child of God. If you find value in this, if you wouldn't mind sharing it with others, that they too could find comfort of Christ, that they too could be built up with, with thought out theological questions and answers and conversation about various things happening in our curious, crazy culture, well, I would appreciate it. All of us here at KFUO greatly appreciate it. Until next time, I'm out of time, so Christ be with you. I'll talk to you next week. Cross Defense is a production of KFUO Radio. Find past episodes and support Cross Defense at kfuo.org.